Here's an idea. If you're tired of having such a small propeller up front when you fly, maybe it's time to upgrade to a whopping huge rotor overhead. Yeah, we're talking about helicopter add-on ratings right here, right now. Greetings, nation. I'm so happy to be back to wrap up this month's series on adding value to your pilot certificate. And speaking of value, check out this new shirt. I mean, it's great. If you come by the AOPA campus during Sun and Fun, that's April 5th to 10th in Lakeland, Florida, I will be happy to model it for you personally. But that's not why we're here today, is it? No, we're here to talk about helicopter add-on ratings. You know, we owe a lot to Igor Ivanovich Sikorsky. Not only was he a prolific airplane designer in his younger years, that's him behind me with a bunch of his early designs, but Igor is also the visionary engineering genius who dreamed up, designed, and built the first successful helicopter way back in 1939. Yeah, Leonardo da Vinci may have drawn one up way back in the olden days, but Igor actually built it and flew it, personally. Now, not all airplane pilots see the beauty of the helicopter as a flying machine, or even as a logically constructed collection of parts. It has been said that helicopters don't actually fly, they're just so ugly they repel the earth. But in truth, the helicopter brought the benefits of vertical takeoff and landing to the pilot's tool bag, which is a game changer for all of us, whether we know it or not. You might not have thought about this too often or too seriously, but helicopters do some remarkable work that affects all of us in some way, from firefighting to law enforcement, TV news, emergency medical transport, hauling bulky or heavy freight, landing supplies on ships at sea, delivering workers to oil rig platforms, even the Army, Navy, and the U.S. Coast Guard all operate helicopters. Yeah, helicopters have brought a whole new level of utility to pilots and passengers the world over. And as an FAA certificated fixed wing pilot, that's what helicopter people call airplane people, they call us fixed wing pilots, you can add a helicopter rating to your certificate. And you can probably do it a lot quicker than you thought you could because you already hold an airplane certificate. And it doesn't matter if that's a private or a commercial or an ATP, you can add a helicopter private pilot rating with just 30 hours of additional training. That breaks down to a mandatory 20 hours of dual and just 10 hours of solo flight time. You already know how to read a VFR sectional chart. You've demonstrated your ability to understand the various types of airspace used in the system. As a private pilot or better, you know how to use the radio making various calls that you'll be using in flight, and you've got plenty of experience getting weather briefings and putting your aeronautical decision making into play as you make go, no-go decisions for every phase of flight. There's a whole lot of piloting knowledge that's already locked into your head. So you can imagine, with all those issues already out of the way, all you really have to do is learn how to fly a very different kind of flying machine. Now years ago, I was lucky enough to instruct at a flight school that had fixed wing aircraft, airplanes, and rotor wing aircraft, helicopters. We operated Enstrom F-28s, a two-seat training helicopter that was, at the time, something of the helicopter equivalent of a Cessna 152. You might also be familiar with the Robinson R-22 and R-44, both of which are in common use today. I was lucky enough to get to fly that Enstrom a few times when our, when our helicopter instructor took it out for a maintenance flight. That's when the pilot takes an aircraft out after it has been returned to service after being in maintenance. We go out and fly it to make sure everything really works like it's supposed to, and it usually does. If all goes well, 
That's when we put it back on the line and start taking paying customers up in it. To be honest, I love those flights. Not that I was all that good at flying helicopters, I really wasn't, but they sure caught my attention. Now, some of the controls on the helicopter look pretty much like the controls in an airplane. You've got pedals to rest your feet on and a, and a stick between your knees, and, and there's a big old handle down at the left side of your seat that, that kind of looks like a big flap handle, but that's not what any of those controls are called, and they don't work like the controls on an airplane at all. Those pedals aren't rudder pedals, they're anti-torque pedals. They operate that small rotor at the tail of the helicopter. That little rotor counters the torque caused by having this huge rotor spinning overhead. Considering the size of an airplane propeller, which is fairly small in comparison, and we still have to deal with the torque that delivers to us, just imagine the force that the main rotor generates. So. Helicopter pilots have anti-torque pedals to counteract those forces. The stick isn't called a stick either. It's the cyclic. Moving the cyclic actually tips the rotor blades in the direction the pilot wants to go. The helicopter isn't limited to forward, left, and right. It can go backwards too. Anywhere you want to go, the helicopter can go. Although when the rotor is turning, we would be more correct to think of the blades collectively as forming a rotor disc. The cyclic tips that spinning rotor disc slightly, which causes the helicopter to move in the direction the disc is pointing to. Just like in an airplane, the total lift generated by a spinning propeller or a rotor disc is perpendicular to the tip path of the rotating airfoil. Move the cyclic forward and the disc tips forward. Move the cyclic to the left, the disc moves left. Simple, get it? No, it's not simple, but I think you see what I mean. That big flap handle looking thing down on the left side of your seat, that's the collective. Pulling up on the collective increases the climb rate. Lowering the collective increases the descent rate. That's easy enough to remember, right? Oh, and by the way, there's a hand grip on the end of the collective. That isn't um, just a handle, that's the throttle. It rolls back and forth. By the way, and I want you to think about this, I mean, not so much that it totally blows your mind, but enough to have some serious respect for good old Igor back there and his brilliance. When the helicopter is in forward flight, the advancing blade of the rotor disc has a higher airspeed than the retreating blade. That makes sense, right? The advancing blade is accelerating into the relative wind, while the retreating blade is actually moving in the direction of the relative wind, pretty quickly, too. That means the angle of attack of the blades, as they go through the air, have to be constantly changing as they rotate through their full 360 degree path. A lower angle of attack is required on the advancing blade, and a higher angle of attack is needed on the retreating blade. It's almost as if the rotor disc is doing turns around a point all the time, always compensating for their changing relationship to the relative wind. This is some seriously cool stuff. Now, let's add some excitement to the cool factor. Just as airplane pilots have to learn to handle a potential engine failure, so does the helicopter pilot. The difference is airplanes glide, helicopters plummet. So helicopter pilots use the tools available to them to use the gravitational pull of the helicopter to their advantage. The maneuver is called an auto rotation. If the engine fails and there's no power going to the main rotor, which is the airfoil holding you up in the air, they accept the reality of the situation and let the helicopter fall toward the earth. <laughs> it's like they have a choice. As the helicopter descends, they use the collective to control the pitch of the rotor blades, allowing the airspeed to wind the rotor up to high speed. The pilot's collective control inputs are controlling the airspeed at this point, the speed through the air, while the cyclic inputs control the rotor speed. 
Obviously, you want to keep the approach speed fairly constant while simultaneously keeping the rotor speed up to a desirable rate, something in the 97 to 102% range. As the helicopter nears the ground, a bit of aft cyclic will begin to slow the helicopter's forward speed and its descent rate. Let's face it, it's an art and a science. Truthfully, there's a bit more to it than I can explain here, but I think you get the point. It's worth knowing that helicopter pilots have a procedure for dealing with an engine out situation, just like airplane pilots do. It's just a different procedure than you're used to, but you can learn it. Heck, <laughs> you're a pilot, you can do pretty much anything, right? Nation. I can't thank you enough for sticking with me and working your way through these amazing options for getting even more out of our aviation endeavors. Over the past few weeks, we've learned that in addition to taking off and landing on a nice, flat, paved runway like the ones we're used to, we can also take a tail dragger out and land on the grass or, or even on unimproved gravel and dirt strips. We've looked at the option of taking off and landing on water, whether that's a lake or a river or even the oceans of the world, which, as we all know from grade school, oceans cover more than 70% of the Earth's surface. That's a lot of extra places to operate out of if you're inclined to fly in shorts while wearing flip-flops or Crocs like Abby Kellett does. We've even taken a peek at what it takes to add a glider rating onto your pilot certificate so you can soar on thermals like the birds. Or even slip into a harness that holds an engine and a fuel tank and a propeller so you can launch out of a local park or a farmer's field with the appropriate permission, of course, and float on the breeze under the canopy of a powered parachute, just like Jeff Goyne. And now we've added the amazing utility of the helicopter to that list of options. Imagine, you might just find yourself landing and departing from the roof of a building right in the heart of downtown. And those aren't the only options available to you as a pilot. We haven't even begun to talk about multi-engine add-ons or turbine training. Those alternatives are available to you too. All you have to do is pick what you want to do and the appropriate aircraft that will help you do it. Then start training. Thanks so much for being a part of this journey. Hey, do me a favor. If you decide to take the leap and try one of these options for yourself, as I have, as Jason has, leave a comment down below. And if you've already started, definitely let us know how you like the new training program you're involved in. We're not just the M0A nation here, we're family, which is why I always show up at Jason's house at Christmas time, just in case he got me something really sweet to play with. Um, can you say Piper Cub? Seriously, do your thing, share your joy, and let your many M0A cousins know what you're up to and where you're flying. Until next time, be safe, have fun, and please remember, a good pilot is always learning.